And the core problem remains because the majority of mainstream Muslim American organizations are Islamists. And I started MALA because Muslim Americans deserve better. Now, post-October 7th, the masks came off. And I think we can all agree that universally the line of empathy and humanity changed. What I found to be so deeply disturbing was that simply sharing empathy or reaching out to support our Jewish American brothers and sisters, somehow that translated into supporting and signaling a, a, a signal of support for bombing Gaza. How many of us have heard this? I'm not against Jews, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm against Zionism, I'm anti-Zionism. That has become the reason why Cheryl made this film. This is why the denial happens. I have the op-ed in the Wall Street Journal because we have a lot of work to do in the community. I, I wrote about anti-Semitism in the Muslim American community because October 7th drew a line in the sand. And I will say that the problem is going to continue as long as we have organizations like CARE having a seat and being present at the White House summit on the anti-Semitism, we are going to continue having this problem. And as long as we have elected officials like Rashida Talib and Ilhan Omar be the main faces of Muslim American civic engagement, we are not getting anywhere. And this is why we started this. This is why, because Mala is so important, we need Muslim American voices. We need a place. We need a home for voices like myself, like Ahmad's. This is the reason why you can be proud of your Muslim American heritage. You can reject grievances. You can set an example to break anti-Semitism that's been passed on from generation to generation. Because all it does is it disempowers and marginalizes us, and it justifies the hate that exists in our community. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Can I just briefly say that thanks to uh, Zena reaching out to me soon after she, it's October 7th, she got me an op-ed, helped me get an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, helped me get uh, in front of multiple organizations, get to the Oslo Freedom Forum. So I'm incredibly, like, this is the idea of creating a new political home for people that are outside the binaries, and I'm really grateful for Mala and I'm grateful for his name, and the like-minded Arabs and Muslims who are rejecting the binary thing. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I am so proud of you. You know, when I read your piece, I was in tears. Because I'm in my heart, I mean, I've had many, many events, and all of them are culturally diverse. Because in my heart, I believe that our global community is going to destroy itself unless we all come together. So thank you so much for everything that you've been doing. You know, I wanted, thank you, I wanted to talk about the plight of women at this point because one of the things that shocked me most of all is the way women organizations were silent. I mean, we watched these things. Yes. I went with Hillary Clinton to the UN when the UN women would not make a sound or make any statement after October 7. It took eight weeks before they even made a statement. And they made a statement because of Hillary Clinton. Because she put her foot down and absolutely insisted that if they didn't, she was going to give interviews and hold a press conference about the fact that the UN Women Organization is silent about the atrocities on October 7th. And I hope everybody here appreciates the way that she's moved forward and became such an important voice. But the next question is to you, Heidi. First of all, why is it that UN Women was silent for so long, and in fact, the first statement was really minimal, and really didn't go into the proof that these things really happened until six months from the date of birth. 
please tell me what your thoughts are. I would love to tell you what my thoughts are on all of this. First, uh, Daphna, I want to thank you so much for making this evening possible. The film dropped on YouTube on April 25th, and we spoke shortly thereafter about it. Then the footage of the five young women hostages were released, and it was devastating. And Anila, Soraya, and Daphna and I got on a call and said this, this has to happen sooner rather than later. So it was a wild ride, and here we are tonight. So I'm really grateful to you for such a just an honorable evening and that so many people turned out and to be hit, hit that ever, it is an important issue that we needed to elevate. So thank you for all of the effort that went into this. Thank you. And bringing all of the teams together to everything. So I also need to share that I've been doing work with Women's Voices now for 12 years and my job is to watch films about atrocities against women all over the world. And something that arises from that experience is seeing that no matter who you are as a woman, what country you come from, religious, religion, race, creed, whatever your multiple identities are, violence against women is universal and it's the same all over the world. So it stands to reason that when an atrocity against women occurs that we would all rise up and speak out against this because it is really a global issue. So the silence of UN women uh, shocked me, as, as did the silence of women's rights organizations all over the world because everything I thought we were going toward apparently was a lie and I'm still recovering from this and, and carefully figuring out who are the allies in this work and how do we move forward in this time. Um, but the truth of the matter is that as a world, as a global culture, we have an issue with sexual violence and not addressing it. So it is actually the best time in the world to be a woman. You have access to economic opportunities, education, political representation, but the one statistic that only gets worse is violence against women. Before the pandemic, it was one in four women in the world will experience violence in their lifetime. After the pandemic, it's one in three. In preparation of this evening, I scrolled through every single uh, tweet of Secretary General Antonio Guterres to see, you know, how much did he talk about the sexual violence of Hamas? And, you know, because everyone has different ac accusations. They did address it, they didn't address it, so I'm like, fine, let me just go to the horse's mouth and see what, what he did or didn't say. There is sexual violence happening in Tigray, uh, forced sterilization of Uyghur women in China. There is incidents in Ukraine, in Haiti, in. In Israel on October 7th, there is enormous amounts of sexual violence happening all over the world. He doesn't mention any of those things in his tweets. Actually, sexual violence committed by Hamas gets about four or five since October 7th. So comparatively, it's, the issue is actually on his mind. At the same time that he was finally making a statement publicly around November 29th, at the same time, UN peacekeepers who had traded services they were supposed to provide to women in the DRC for sex were finally being brought to justice. And he didn't tweet about that. That would have been a real effort to show we are serious about addressing sexual violence in the world. So this is a global women's rights issue. It is not surprising that the UN was silent on it. What was surprising was that the rest of the world was silent on this issue. Yes. Yes. It's actually shocking for me to think that women can remain silent at the atrocities that other women go through. You know, I was just, I, I was just privy to a documentary actually film that was taken in Ukraine, you know, by the, ra the rapes and violations and violence against young women that are trying to cross the border it is horrific, and not one word is mentioned in the news about that. And not one women organization has done anything about it. So it is horrific to think that women can be treated like that and that it's normalized. So my question is to you, Anila. You have gone out of your way to lead Muslim women organizations into standing up for the women that have suffered so much on October 7th and generally for women uh, that are suffering from violence against them. Can you please talk about what you guys are doing? Thank you so much, Daphna. I'm so happy to be here, to see so many diverse faces listening to our story because that's what we want to do. I want you to look at those, imagine the faces of the criminals, the, the butchers that you saw in Cheryl's uh, documentary. What kind of husband, father, 
Brother, do you think they are? Isn't that so sad for the Muslim women of the world? That those are the men that are representing Islam? And young people on campuses are thinking Hamas is the savior of the Palestinians? Give me a break. What has happened to us? That we have come to this, that today, violence against women, atrocities committed by the, the world's biggest criminal organization, Hamas, Hezbollah, Muslim Brotherhood in America, and we have to tell people that these girls are telling the truth? Something is wrong in our moral compass that we are not able to stand with these women and say Hamas is bad for Palestine, Hamas is bad for Muslim women, Islam is going to suffer because of them. How do I know that, Daphna?